Hey there, hi there, hello there, everybody. This is James J. Patterson coming to you live from the reading room at Allen Squire Publishing, a small press with big ideas. Today I'm going to read two short pieces. One is an original piece of mine, a new one, that is going to be included in a book called Junk Shop Window. When that will come out, I'm not real sure, but uh, it'll be a book a lot like my first book, Bermuda Shorts, uh, with memoir, creative nonfiction, and fiction. But before I get to that, I want to uh, uh, read something from uh, uh, a buddy of mine, Richard Peabody. Now, I know some of you folks are shut in with your children. Some of them are small children. Some of them are girls. And there's some daddies out there who need to take care of those girls. And Richard has some insights about that. And he has written a short piece for his book, The Richard Peabody Reader. And it is called, wait for it, Princess Daddy. I am Princess Daddy, complete with tiara. And I'm on route to the princess planet with Twyla, my three-year-old whirlwind of a daughter. She has constructed a spaceship out of wooden blocks to transport us. She's wearing her purple tutu. Where's your tutu, Daddy? Good question. One my wife wishes to remedy at the very next thrift sale. My Redskins t-shirt does clash a little with my silver tiara. I wonder just how the guys in Section 114 will relate to me when I show up at FedEx dressed like this. I'll get in training. No, 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 Twyla says. I'm on the wrong side of the airlock, the wrong side of the wall of blocks. I scuttle across the rug. I sigh loudly. I had a tomboy in training for about two years, but no longer. Soccer and uppy ball, basketball. Looked like locks. Now, Twyla is a girly girl, more interested in her hair ties than playing outdoors. The first time I ever took Twyla into a bookstore, she waddled to a display and brought me back a book on glitter nails. I knew I was doomed right then, but lived in denial. The past three years, a complete and total blur. Twilight hasn't actually done my nails yet, though she occasionally does my hair. I forgot once and met a postal worker at the door with pigtails and shiny plastic clips in my hair. And it occurs to me that if he has sons, he won't get it at all. Having daughters has changed me for sure. Still, I want Twyla to be happy, so I cut her a bit of slack. I also want her to let me answer my email in peace without commanding me to be her slave. Twyla assures me that once we land on the princess planet, we will find lots and lots of Barbies. So, so that's where they come from. Every time I walk that pink aisle at Toys R Us, I have indeed left the cosmos. Watch a covey of three-year-old girls approach that aisle and learn what reverence is all about. Wear my mermaid, Ariel is naked under a black washcloth at the bottom of the tub upstairs. I know this because we left her sleeping underwater last night. Twyla's fingers are too tiny to manipulate the Disney clothing, so it falls to me to dress the miniature doll for space travel. Luckily, a three-year-old is still sometimes distracted tricked or manipulated by a tired daddy who just wants his kid to nap. Because nothing looks better right this second than an afternoon nap. Not vodka, coffee, or the promise of a hot night in Vegas. Twyla is wearing her silver and purple mules. She's clumping them all over the hardwood floors like Shirley Temple with a bad case of Scarlet O'Hara fever. No boys are allowed on the princess planet. I'm a boy, I tell her. No, you a princess daddy. And Twyla explains, mommies, babies, and sisters are peoples. Boys, men's, and brothers, not peoples. But daddies are boys, I explain. No, they not, Twyla laughs. Daddy's man's, no people. I'm so confused my head is rotating, and then I get it. The trick to space travel for males is to be a princess daddy. A princess daddy is people. What are you, I ask, Twyla laughs. My a girl. Maya people. I try to imagine my real man father visiting the princess planet. Impossible. 
I try to imagine one of my buddies visiting the princess planet with their daughters. Still doubtful, but more doable somehow. Would Laura Ingalls Wilder's dad make this trip? Come on, nap time. I am Princess Daddy, en route to the princess planet. And I don't care who knows it. Eat your heart out, Captain Kirk. I love this this compendium of stories by Peabody. And you know, if you ever get in a funk, you know, you get in a funk and you need to get sorted, you need to change the subject. Well, this guy is kind of a combination of Mark Twain, J.D. Salinger, and Kurt Vonnegut. But he's really a whole lot of Peabody. And we could all use a whole lot of Peabody. Anyway, the next thing I'm going to read is uh, from Junk Shop Window, yet to be released. And uh, thinking about this quarantine and, uh, and all of us kind of shut in, I'm reminded of a time many years ago when I had a similar experience, and uh, it involved doctors too. And uh, this is called Hermes and the Bathtub. It was four in the morning on a weekday. When I woke up, I was behind the wheel in a van full of newspapers going 80 miles an hour down a quiet small town neighborhood street. It was a seven day a week job, and it had been several months, maybe a year, since my last day off. The guy I had brought to keep me awake was fast asleep in the passenger seat. We didn't wear seat belts because we normally spent all night stopping and starting, jumping in and out of the vehicle, dropping bundles. We were in a V8-powered box made of double-plated U.S. steel, and we were moving really fast. Two telephone poles later, one down on the street, the other on top of the van, both throwing wires this way and that, and a parked station wagon bent in half. I was pulled from the burning vehicle by that same helper, now fully awake, having been spared by the wall of ten-pound bundles of newsprint that fell down on him when we hit the first pole. He ripped my head back from where it was lodged in the steering wheel, gripped my torso under my dislocated shoulders, and pulled me through a shattered window. As a matter of fact, I remember distinctly. As that second pole rushed up to meet us, directly in front of me, and knowing I was about to die, thinking simply and calmly, what a shame. Six weeks or more later, I was back on my feet, if a little tenuous on my pins with a cane to support my mangled left leg, when something quite alarming began occurring in my lower regions. The urologist said that part of my body had gone into post-traumatic shock, and a condition called epididymitis set in. You'll have to look it up. I'm not going to describe it here. Suffice to say that the family jewels had swelled to the size of a very healthy pomegranate. The doctor told me there were no drugs that could get to that part of the body to alleviate my discomfort or get me back to normal, but there was a good chance that rendering that part of my body warm and weightless for several hours a day might have a calming and healing effect. The doctor prescribed five one-hour long baths a day, as hot as I could stand them, and advised me to make whatever might cause stress in my life to go away. And I remember laughing to myself and thinking, that would mean tell everybody I know to get lost. So on my way home from the doctor to begin another six-week ordeal of recuperation and realizing that I was not only going to be laid up once more, but that I was also to be hot water logged as well, I pulled into my favorite bookstore at the time, Brentano's, and decided to stock up for the deluge. And so I found myself staring at a wall of science fiction the like of which I haven't seen before or since. Brentano's, if you don't know, was a marvelous small chain of large bookstores, large meaning about 5,000 square feet. Their selection of classic fiction, portables, seemed endless, and their sci-fi section took up an entire wall. To someone not truly familiar with the genre, that was daunting, but I was in the mood for the fantastic, not the stark and very real. I had just had a big dose of that, and that was plenty for me. I had loved sci-fi movies when I was a kid, loved the comic books and the paperback magazines too. I had read Jules Verne and H.G. Wells when I was a young reader, but once I fell in love with Dickens, then Steinbeck, then Herman Hesse, 
then the romantic poets, my reading was as far from the genre as it could get. As I stood there gazing at this wall of colorful, sensational, gaudy-looking book covers, big fat trilogies, anthologies of epic off-world adventures, I decided now would be a perfect time to acquaint myself with a few titles. But I was at a real loss. I wanted in, but I would need a guide. I've always felt a kinship with the notion that the gods often appear to us momentarily in the guise of amicable strangers. You have experienced this. Suddenly someone steps out of a crowd, out of nowhere, and gives you an unsolicited piece of information or advice or an idea. Then he or she slips away. It's over so fast you just pause momentarily. If you remember the event at all, you may even think you dreamed it. I have also wondered what in the world one might call such a creature. A creature who could take possession of a living, breathing human being for the sole purpose of telling someone else something they need to know? I don't think there's a patron saint of mysterious hint givers or a secret league of cryptic messengers. Well, come to think of it, maybe there is one. Nevertheless, the god I can most closely associate with this phenomenon is the trickster messenger god Hermes. Hermes is a strange cat. He steals, but only to put things back. He lies, but only to convince you to get back on track. Maybe I can better explain by describing this kind of happening in reverse. When you are suddenly overcome with an overpowering urge to tell someone you don't know something they hadn't thought of, possessed of an idea in an elevator, say, or the subway, or moving along with a slow moving crowd, you see just the right person. They pause, a remark, an observation, a pithy piece of advice is ready to leap off your tongue. You call it out, and suddenly it's you who are the messenger. You have become Hermes, if only for an instant. Know it or not, you've done that too. By no means am I a scholar of mythology. I will, however, pounce on new translations of Homer. Fagel's is still my fave, but Emily Wilson has recently turned my head. I've always found First Nation and Native American nature deities fascinating, as well as Vedic seers and Haitian spirit guardians of the crossroads, to name a few others. So I'm open to the concept that we sometimes communicate on levels we ourselves don't truly understand. So there I was, standing before that inscrutable wall of sci-fi, feeling lost and bewildered, but knowing that the secret to my next six weeks was right in front of me, would that I had eyeballs with which to see. Enter Hermes. Feeling a presence near me, I turned, and there he was, a Vietnam veteran. Clearly, they were everywhere in those days. He was about my age, perhaps three or four years older, wearing a worn and tattered army fatigue, long, unkempt hair, boots. He held a cane to reinforce his damaged left leg. Same as I. He wasn't looking at the wall of books. He had already made his purchase. He was looking at me and clearly aware of my bewilderment. I looked at the wall, then back at him, then back at the book he held in his hand a very fat paperback, and I said, you look like someone who might know his way down this great wall of titles. Oh, I read almost all of them, all the good ones, that is, he smiled. When I explained that I was new and didn't want to just grab stuff that looked interesting, he entirely agreed, said I would invariably pick something terrible, take it home and hate it, then never read another. Would you like me to recommend a few? I remember that what struck me was the sudden formal tone in his question, and I realized he was trying to ascertain whether or not I was serious or just making conversation. When I assured him I was indeed serious and shared a brief account of my situation, he seemed charmed, and for the better part of an hour, he calmly gave me his breakdown of what clearly to him was more than a reader's delight. It was a devotion. It begins and ends here he said reverently, handing me a recently published single-volume oversized paperback of the three books comprising Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy. A few years later, I would recognize Asimov's universe as the backdrop to a new film called Star Wars, and just about every other space adventure I've enjoyed since then. Another book, book he plucked from the shelf was Dune by Frank Herbert. If you're going to be in the tub that much, you might enjoy reading about a world where there's no water, a desert world, with sandworms as big as dinosaurs, and everybody's hooked on a spice that turns the whites of their eyes blue. Yes, I just might be interested in a world like that. 
Herbert had yet to bastardize his classic with several lesser sequels. Hey, we all gotta eat. Another book he chose was by Jack London, of all people. The Star Rover is about a man in a straitjacket in the dungeon of a prison, having out-of-body experiences where he visits his past lives, which he's living simultaneously. It might help you get out of that tub without actually getting out of that tub, he smiled. That young vet turned me on to Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein, and the word grok, basically a synonym for to understand, as well as books by Harlan Ellison, Andre Alice Norton, Piers Anthony, and many others, I still pick up and read today. As I gathered up this armful of loot and made my way to the checkout counter, I looked around the store, but my mentor was gone. It had started to rain, not heavily, and I tucked my, I tucked my bundle of books under my arm, inside my buckskin jacket, and cane in hand, stepped outside. A few paces down the street, he was suddenly at my side once more. Before I could say anything, he reached into a satchel he carried over his shoulder and pulled out the same book he had been holding when we met. It was obviously the book he had come to the store to buy that afternoon. A giant book of short stories, edited, I think, by Robert Heinlein. Most everybody who's anybody is in this book, he said, and handed it to me. And when I looked at him, slightly stunned, he said simply, To thank you for asking. And he turned, hobbled off down the street, and we went our separate ways in the rain. I never knew his name, but he turned those hundreds of hours I spent in that scalding hot tub into a literary adventure that changed my life, that I still draw upon to this day. Once again, thank you, my friend. And whatever became of you, I hope you were appreciated. For your information, the baths worked. So I'll be back next Monday. I'll read a couple of more. I want to advise you to tune in Wednesday at 4 o'clock to Rose Solari's webpage on Facebook, where she'll read some poems for you and maybe give you some advice and some hints. This is James J. Patterson saying, go on down to allensquarepublishing.com. We're having a two-for-one sale, lots of bundles, lots of great stuff. We'll ship them from here. We'll wipe them down. No danger. So, so long for now. We'll see you next Monday. Take a read.